Good morning. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11 from the NIV. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the warm, sunny day that you've given us. We thank you for each one who is here this morning and those who are attending at home. We ask that you be with Pastor Jake as he brings the message to us and be a blessing to each one. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I always say it and I say it again. It's good to be with you folk. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew, or I hope you kept them open to Matthew chapter 4. And did you all get an outline? If you didn't get an outline, would you raise your hands? I think there are lots back there. Anybody need one? All right, they're doing okay. You know, life has an interesting mix, doesn't it? There are our births, and then there are birthdays, and there are marriages, and there are deaths. Uh, I say that to say that just um, a few months ago, another little baby boy was added to my clan, a great-grandson, and they named him Darian Jacob, and that put a little tear in my eye that they would name him after me. And um, uh, now I have six great-grands. On May the 1st, just uh, the start of this month, my sister Eve uh, went to glory. She was uh, 79, had a battle, battle with uh, lung cancer and then was hit with a bad stroke. Cancer got her body, but praise God, it never got her spirit. And uh, she's safe at home with the Lord. Yesterday was Diane's granddaughter Ashanti's wedding out in Winkler. So our day was spent in Winkler yesterday and got home kind of late. So I'm sorry my wife isn't here this morning. And I told the young couple and others who were listening in that apparently Eve asked Adam one day, Adam, do you love me? And Adam said, who else? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and uh, I try to tell them, you know, there are a lot of people around, but who else asked you to love but the one that's in your marriage? And today, my baby son is turning 58, and I, those, those kids are just pushing up my age. I have three boys. They are now 58, 59, and 60, and uh, I don't know where time has gone. Anyhow, this is kind of the mix that we're in, right? Birth, birthdays, marriages, growing up, getting older, enjoying life, death, going home to heaven, etc. Well, let's go to our topic for this morning on the victor teaching us to be victorious. I refer to the New American Standard Bible. And I would like to start off by saying that I think all of us, God's people, need a two-tiered faith, a two-level faith. We need to have a faith in which we have a resting faith where we enjoy our relationship with the Lord uh, we have peace in our hearts. We have full confidence in the Lord. We uh, are justified by faith. We have wonderful assurance. And there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the resting faith that we should all be able to enjoy. But at the same time, we ought also always to have a fighting faith in the spiritual war that we're in every day, 
trusting God for victory. Today, we're not giving you a nice three-point message. Today, we're trying to answer a bunch of questions, okay? Number one, is it sin to be tempted? And of course, we would all say no. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Temptation is a common occurrence to all of us. Uh, I'm never tempted to go and get drunk on Saturday night. I'm never tempted to go and join a few fellows and go and steal a car. I have other areas that I need to guard against, and the enemy has sought to, to tempt me in the area of bitterness, discouragement to the point where I almost quit the ministry at one point, uh, morally, uh, things like being impatient or critical in, in my thought life and so on. And I'm reminded of the words of Billy Graham, who one day said, you cannot keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. And that's the case with your thought life, okay? And that's where you activate your will. You know, some temptations are so inviting, and the enemy knows how to set the traps. And sometimes people, Christians know that this is wrong, but... It's like the picture I saw one time of a mouse sitting at a trap that was loaded and had a piece of cheese in it. And this mouse is strongly contemplating on how to get that cheese, and he puts a helmet on his head. He knows this is a dangerous thing, but he still wants that piece of cheese. And you know, that is how the enemy sometimes tempts us. Uh, we should never sit contemplating whether this is okay or not, if we know it is wrong, Joseph in the Old Testament didn't weigh matters out. When he was tempted, he ran. He ran away from the uh, sin. So the sin is in the yielding, giving in to temptation, as uh, Horatio Palmer wrote many years ago. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you another to win. Uh, fight valiant, uh, some others, yeah, fight valiantly onward, evil passions subdue, look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, come forth, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, he will carry you through. Amen? Question number two, why was Jesus tempted? And I'll let William McDonald in his commentary, Believer's Bible commentary, answer this one. The answer is that this temptation was necessary to demonstrate his moral fitness to do the work for which he had come into the world. The purpose of the temptation was not to see if he would sin, but to prove that even under tremendous pressure, he would not uh, do nothing but obey the word of God. So it was to prove his character, to prove who he was. Number three, did the devil know that Jesus was the Son of God? Yes, no, maybe, what do you think? I would say, well, let's say, the enemy said to him three times, if, if you are, if you are, if you are. You know what? He knew, the devil knew who he was dealing with. This passage, in the, at least in my version, starts off with the word then. This connects us with, which, with what has gone on before. And what happened before? The baptism of Jesus had just taken place. And God the Father had said, this is who? My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And you can be quite assured that the devil attended the baptismal service. The devil attends a lot of services. And he does a lot of distracting and tempting. And if not, he himself, at least his cohorts. And we can be sure that he knew and heard this statement. This is my beloved son. So the word here carries the meaning since. Kenneth Wiest, a Greek uh, <clears throat> um, uh, teacher, points out, in view of the fact that you are the son of God, do this, do this, do this. Satan knew who Jesus was. He knew who he was dealing with. Uh, and and Satan was seeking to derail Christ from God's plan. Number four, why was the first temptation about food? Let's ask another question or two. Why, where does the tire of the car blow out? Where does the balloon bust? Where does the rope break? You say at the weakest 
point, right? At its weakest point. And there are, uh, and where are you? Where am I most frequently tempted? In the areas where we are vulnerable, the areas of our weakness. And what might have been Christ's weakness, or at least this is what the enemy thought, was the need for food. He must have been extremely hungry. So that simply tells, I think, all of us that the area that we need to guard most is where we already know we have a weakness. The man who years ago would come with his horse and come to town with his horse and buggy and uh, tie up his horse at the hitching post in front of the tavern, got saved, and from here on, when he comes to town, it's best for him to park his horse two blocks away, right? Instead of being tempted at this place again. So we must guard our weak spot, but you know what? I've also come to the conclusion in my life and from what I've observed, we also must guard our strong points. Where we think we are strong, where we are doing well. Um, for example, if um, I can become, if I'm not careful, I can become self-reliant, self-confident, cocky, proud in what I'm doing or you and what you're doing. And we're beginning to rely on self and that which we have learned to do. Very dangerous. There has no temptation taking you but such as is common to man, but God who is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above you that you're able but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. And the verse before that says, verse 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Um, I'm reminded maybe this fits, maybe it doesn't, but anyhow, David, Her David Hawking, whom you can hear on the radio uh, daily in the mornings, and C.K. J.S. told one, told, uh, shared one time on his, in a message on radio, he was preaching in Canada, <laughs> and during the message, a man got up and he said, I have not sinned since I got saved. And his wife says, ah, oh, sit down, you sin every day. I guess she knew her husband. Uh, he thought he was doing pretty good, but uh, take heed that you do not fall. By the way, God gives grace to one group of people. And you have this in James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 6. To whom does God give grace? To the humble. The people who are willing to come to the place and say, Lord, I need help. I need your salvation. I can't do it on a... And so salvation depends on being saved by grace and we humble ourselves and accept Christ. And this is true in our Christian walk. When we get stuck about uh, different things and we're tempted, God is going to give us grace as we uh, trust him and submit to him and resist the devil. <clears throat> Number five, at what locations did the, the temptations happen? Well, verse one points out in the wilderness. And very often when this is talked about, we say Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. That's true, but he was tempted elsewhere. Verse five points out that the second temptation happened at in Jerusalem at the temple. John MacArthur, regarding the pinnacle of the temple, writes, this is probably a roof with a portico at the southeast corner of the temple complex where a massive retaining wall reached from a level well above the temple mound and deep into the Kedron Valley. According to Jewish historian Josephus, this was a drop of nearly 450 feet. And the third temptation, verse 8, took place in a high mountain. So there's three different locations, in the wilderness, uh, at the temple, and then also at, uh, at a high mountain. <clears throat> Number six, in what areas, in what areas in his life was Jesus tempted? I believe we have the answer in 1 John chapter 2, <coughs> verses 15 to 17. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Listen to these words. Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Here you have it. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God will live forever. The flesh, pride, and the eyes. The lust of the flesh, here the enemy, verse 3, is appealing to the flesh in Christ's life. The lust or the desire for food. He seems to say, you are very hungry. Take care of your appetite. Why don't you make these stones into bread? Somehow when I read this, I think of that John 20 passage where Jesus, after the resurrection, met with about seven uh, disciples. They're fishing, and in the meantime, he has breakfast ready. Did he say stones turn into bread, or did he go to 7-Eleven? We're not told. But uh, whatever the case, he had breakfast ready and maybe turned stones into bread there. But he would not do this at the suggestion of Satan, regardless of how hung hungry he was. And Christ's response was, it is written, Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, Man shall not live, as we sang, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I went to Steinbeck Bible Institute a long time ago, which is now called college, and uh, we would eat our meals there, and I'd, I had to so often say, please pass the bread. Please, I was a bread eater, and somebody finally quoted, man shall not live by bread alone, okay? I was reminded there. <laughs> Number two, <clears throat> there's the matter of pride, the pride of life. In verses five and six, the enemy challenges Christ to throw himself down as a spectacular display of his sonship. Since you are the son of God, why not achieve glory without suffering and bypassing the cross? In fact, the devil even quotes from Psalm 91 that God will preserve you. Now, he's not doing this quoting for Jesus' benefit, but he's testing Jesus uh, by employing the scriptures. If he had gone along with the en enemy's suggestion, this could have produced pride. Any human being who would want to do a great display in front of people would have pride well up in his heart, I'm sure. But the response of Jesus again is, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 6, 16. And then the third temptation has to do with the eye gate. And it's the eye gate in each one of us that causes an awful lot of problems. Did you hear what I said? The eye gate causes a lot of problems. Now here the appeal was to the eyes. And the devil said, I will give you, just look at this, look at all of these kingdoms. Of the, I'll, give, I'll give all of this to you if you will fall down and worship me. Uh, let me just pick up this thing about the eyes being a uh, difficulty. The enemy so often takes <clears throat> people down four steps, as he did with Eve. Eve saw, right? She saw the fruit, and then she lusted for the fruit or desired the fruit. And then thirdly, she took the fruit and because they now had sinned, they hid. There you have the four steps. Saw, desired, took, and hid. This is what happened to Achan. God had made it very clear that when they took the city of Jericho, not to take any of the goods, any of the stuff. But Achan saw a garment that was imported from Babylon, he saw a, um, uh, some shekels, 2,000, I think it is, uh, shekels of silver. He saw a wedge of gold. He not only saw it, but he desired it. He lusted it for it. He took it against God's wishes, and then what did he do? He took it home, and he hid it under the floor of his tent. You can follow this through with Ahab regarding a vineyard that he wanted, Naboth's vineyard in 1 Kings 21. You can follow through on this with Gehazi, 2 Kings 5. And of course, David's unfortunate story in 2 Samuel 11. He saw Bathsheba. He lusted after her. He took her. And then he hid the sin for nine, 12 months. And here the enemy comes and tries to take Jesus down the same road. 
see all of the kingdoms, and that's where Jesus stopped him. He did not follow through on those temptations. So let's keep those in mind. Anyhow, it's been the desire of the enemy, the devil, to be worshipped right from Isaiah 14, very much the beginning of time. Uh, he wanted to be like God and so on. Now, there is a real sense in which today um, <clears throat> Satan is the ruler of this world, the god of this world, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And I have scriptures uh, for all of these. I won't take time to go there now. He is presently the ruler of this world, the god of this world, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But wait, friends. I'm glad to tell you that in the second advent, according to Revelation 11:15, the Bible says this, and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign for how long? Tell me, forever, forever and ever. And I say, hallelujah, this is a great prospect, right? I don't have this in my notes, but you know, I have this funny illustration in my head of a log floating down a river. And on the log, there are about 20 ants. And every ant thinks I'm in control of this boat, of this. I'm in control of this log. And here you have the Herods, and you have the Nebuchadnezzars, and here you have the <clears throat> Hitlers, and you have the present rulers. And they think they're so much in charge. But I tell you, one day they will all be debased and somebody else will be in charge. Amen? In fact, he is in control even today, so let us not lose hope. Here the response of Jesus is to the enemy regarding this temptation. Go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Deuteronomy 6, verses 13 and 14. Number eight, how did Jesus defeat the tempter? Ephesians 6, 17 is the answer. He used the sword of the spirit. It is written, right? Three times from the book of Deuteronomy, he quoted, it is written. And even though the devil in the Garden of Eden tempted Eve and said, did God really say that? The Bible says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled, and we can stand on that word. And I want to tell us today that this is not primarily a power encounter. I know that John Wimber and others, they really wanted to emphasize this power encounter, and you do some real noisy fighting and so on. Do you know what this is all about? This is a truth encounter. The enemy is a, de the, the, the enemy is a liar. He is deceptive, and he cannot stand up to the truth. The power is in the truth. Got it? You believe that? Uh, J Warren Wearsby has shared this, and I like it. He says, God has given to us three editions of truth. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. You have these verses in, all in the Gospel, John. And then the word, thy word, John 17, 17, is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, O Lord. And so if we stick close to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the word, we are on safe ground. <laughs> now I just want to quickly point out something about the Logos and the Ramas. Now, I only have the New Testament, but the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the Logos. All of the scriptures, the Torah, that is the writings of Moses, the Old Testament history, uh, the Psalms, the prophets, the gospel, the book of Acts, the epistles, the revelation, these make up the, 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 the Logos, whereas the Ramas are specific scriptures for specific situations that can be used in precision, which Jesus did. W.E. Vine, uh, in his Expository Dictionary of New Testament word, uh, Words, explains the distinction between the rhema of the word and the logos of the word. The significance of the rhema, as distinct from the logos, is exemplified in the injunction to take the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, 
And here the reference is not to the whole Bible as such, but to the individual scriptures which the Spirit brings to our remembrance for us in time of need, a prerequisite being the regular storing in the mind with the scriptures. Very important to lay away the word of God in our hearts. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, Psalm 119, 11. I like to use the illustration here of David. Israel was facing the enemy, and there's this huge enemy that comes up every day for 40 days. And David is now willing to face him. How does he face him? First of all, it's not the sling, it's not the stone, but first of all, he says, I'm coming in the name of the Lord. He first of all, I think, had that settled in his heart. I'm coming in the name of the Lord. Then he goes to the brook, and there in the brook are thousands of stones, and he picks up how many? Two? Three? Five. Four? How many? Five. five? Why five? <coughs> we won't go there today, except you might want to check the Old Testament. There were, I think, four other giants around, so he might have been ready for them all. We're not sure what the <laughs> why five. But... What I want you to see here is all of these stones compared to the logo, but he only picked up five smooth stones that he put into his shepherd's bag. And now he was ready for the enemy. That's how we need to tuck away God's word into our shepherd's bag, into our hearts, and be ready for temptations. Number eight, how many temptations did Jesus face? Well, there are three named here, right? And I would like to suggest that these are maybe three major ones that happened at the end of these 40 days. But if you go to the parallel passage in Luke chapter 4, Christ faced many more. Chapter 4 verse 2 says he was tempted for 40 days. Forty days of temptation, but now three of them are, are given to us here. And did Jesus face any more temptations in his life later, or is this it? Well, if you come to the end of the reading in chapter 4, verse 13, the devil left him for an opportune time. Uh oh got it? He's going to seek some other opportunities to tempt Jesus. And I want to warn us, friends, that we have areas of weakness. Guard them carefully because the enemy will want to come back to those areas possibly again sometime. And then Hebrews 4.15 already alluded to, in all, he was in all points tempted alike as we are, and we can be sure that there were other temptations for the next three and a half years before he went to the cross. But I would like to suggest to you, you may agree, you may not agree, I believe that his biggest temptation possibly was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 30, 26, 36, I won't take time to read it, but here the enemy is, is seeking to have him bypass the cross, and Jesus says the flesh is weak, he told his disciples, the spirit is willing. And he incessantly prayed, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And I believe that this was one last great effort that the enemy made trying to dissuade Christ from going to the cross. And by the way, how many times did Jesus die? Well, you say he went to the Calvary and died on the cross. But before that, he died in Gethsemane to his own will. And he wanted his will to be lined up with the Father's will. Ah, time is running by. Let's quickly go to our last point. Number nine, how do we gain and maintain victory? Number one, <clears throat> always remember that we are in a spiritual war every day of our lives. We have a very strong enemy to deal with, but thank God he is no match for our Lord. Our enemy is a tempter. He's deceptive. He is subtle. Secondly, recognize the fact that we will be tempted and tested. 
Now, is there a difference between being tempted and tested? I would like to put it this way. Satan tempts us to bring out the worst in us. The Lord tests us or allows us to be tested in order to bring out the best in us. See the difference? We will be tempted and the enemy will try to take us down to bring out the worst in us. God tests us or allows us to be tested in order to bring out the best in us. You know, you may face a certain situation and you look at it and you might ask yourself, is this a test or is this a temptation? And many times it's exactly, it's both. Uh, let's take Genesis 22 for a minute. Abraham is asked to take his uh, son Isaac to a mountain and uh, the King James Version in Genesis 22 once says, God tempted uh, uh, Abraham and I don't like that uh, rendering at all. Uh, God tempts no one. The devil would maybe tempt him for not to go to that mountain and, uh, you know, have his son killed. The Amplified says God tested and proved Abraham. And so uh, it could have been both to Abraham, a test and a temptation, but he immediately obeyed God and did not fail the test. I'm here reminded of two young men who became powerful preachers, and they served together. And then one began to be tempted to leave the way of the Lord and his preaching, and his name was Charles Templeton. And the other fellow was so strongly tested, namely Billy Graham, that he went off into the woods with his Bible to really have it out with the Lord. And he uh, came through the test victoriously, and God used him mightily. One was tempted and failed. The other one was tested, and he won the victory. Lee Strobel, a former atheist, went to visit um, <clears throat> Charles Templeton before he died. He was doing poorly. I think it was with Parkinson's. And after a lengthy discussion, some of the last words that uh, uh, Templeton shared were these, I wish... I could believe. So let's take an ordinary illustration. You're going down the road and somebody cuts you off. Is this a temptation or a test? Sometimes it's a huge temptation to utter things that you wouldn't want to utter. And so the enemy is working hard at bringing you the worst out of you and you might like to get after the guy for doing this. Whereas you might have had this might be a test whereby the Holy Spirit wants to teach you a little bit more of self-control. Now, if you keep seething about this for the next week, you're not walking in the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, you will be tested, but the Holy Spirit will immediately remind you, this is not good, this is not right, and you ask for forgiveness, you're walking in the Spirit. Got it? And that's what we need every day. Number three. Activate your will. I like to think of the will as being the doorkeeper of your life. <clears throat> we make choices, good or bad, and you know, we have things come to us, and I have things come flying into my mind, and I have to eject it as quickly as possible. Let the, door, uh, the will be a doorkeeper of your mind. You don't do this sh with sheer willpower, but with the Holy Spirit's help submitting to him. Uh, when you read the psalm, uh, psalms, the psalmist so often says, I will do this or that. He makes choices to glorify God. Um, Joseph made a strong, uh, by an act of the will, made a strong good decision to run away from the temptation. Jesus said, your will be done, not mine. And uh, number four, let Christ be our example. <clears throat> he is teaching us two key fundamental resources that we have. Now, I know there are more. We have the armor, we have prayer, we have praise, we have the blood of the lamb, Revelation 12, 11. But the two fundamental resources in this passage have to do with the Holy Spirit and the word. If you read the Luke 4 passage, you will find that Jesus went into the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit and he came out of the wilderness filled with the Holy Spirit. 
What we need to keep in mind is that we need to constantly be word-fed and Holy Spirit-led. Be filled or controlled by the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18, and Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly or in full measure. These two are a powerful con uh, combination, namely the living word of God and the Holy Spirit, to be victorious. I want to share a little experience, which is, is not a temptation, but it is the matter of using, listening to the Holy Spirit and using the word. Many years ago, after an evening service, we invited some folk to come over for a visit and coffee, six, eight people. And while we're in the living room, it was as though the enemy pounced on me, and it seemed that I was going to go out of my mind. I was just sweating almost immediately. And the conversation was continuing in the living room, and these people had no idea what was going on. Holy Spirit led me to Ephesians 6. I, right in the midst there, claimed the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, and I could just feel this thing leave in a few moments' time, and it was gone. And nobody there knew this battle that, I had, been going, that had been going on there for a few minutes. I found the word of God so effective with the help of the Holy Spirit. Number five, our last point, private victories make possible the public victories. And I like to use the illustration here of 1 Samuel 17, where David comes and he's willing to face the giant. But they tell him, hey, you're too young, you're, there's no, <laughs> this is not for you. But he brings out the point that he has in private killed a lion and he killed a bear in order to protect his flock and now he was willing to face a giant publicly and i want to use that as an illustration that those things that we face privately in our lives the bear the um what's the other animal now uh the lion uh we need to take care of them continuously with the help of god in order that we hopefully can also take care of public um, skirmishes that happen in our lives where other people might see it. So, as we grow and mature in spiritual stature, I think we will, we will not become sinless, but we trust God that we will sin less and less, right? Amen. Resting faith, enjoy your walk with God, but have a fighting faith to be more than conquerors with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we conclude, we want to give you thanks that we can depend upon you. Help us to live each day dependent upon your spirit and, uh, and immersed in your word. Uh, give us your strength to guard the areas that need special guarding in our lives. Give us strength to be overcomers. Lord, we long to have a close relationship with you such a close relationship that we will immediately respond to your um, righteousness, to your resources when we face temptations. Help us, Lord, through the Holy Spirit's power and by obedience to your word to guard our lives, our minds, our choices, and our emotions. Thank you, Lord, for this body of believers. Protect them. Put your hedge of protection around them individually and around a group, Father. And may this be a good week in your presence the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.